Hello and welcome to our midweek service. It's nice to be with you again. Uh, I know we've not been able to do a midweek service for a couple of weeks while I had a wee break. Uh, just too much involved in putting services online uh, to be able to do them and also do all the technology involved in getting them there. So apologies that there was a hiatus, but we're back again. Uh, part of that hiatus, of course, means that we don't, we're don't not able to edit a hymn in at the moment. So uh, we're just going to have, uh, I'm just going to... to, to, to pray and preach today. We will be working towards getting the, the shape back that we were uh, putting up for you beforehand. But please bear with. Uh, one of the things, of course, the realities of this strange season that we're in is that in SGT, we're a fluid congregation, lots of people coming and going, and there's a number of key people whose skills we've depended on who are moving on for no other reason than they would have been moving on anyway. But it just leaves us with a little bit of a, a skills gap in terms of some of the technical editing stuff and so on. So we're just managing and there's steep learning curves all around. Anyway, I hope you're well. I hope you're managing to have something of a summer, whether it's a staycation, whether you're just at home or whatever is going on for you. Uh, but I hope that you're well. We're going to be reopening the church this Sunday, the 16th, uh, just for our cafe church service. The numbers are limited and we're asking people to get in touch and tell us in advance if they want to come. So if you want to come along, you can contact uh, through our Facebook page and express an interest, but we do need to know in advance if you're coming. But that's the Sunday service. For the time being, the Wednesday service will still be uh, online. Uh, we're hoping to reopen the cafe at the beginning of September. And when we do that, then we'll look at how we can possibly incorporate the midweek service when the cafe is back open again. So not too long till hopefully we can be physically present again, uh, albeit at a distance. Anyway, all that by way of intimation. Let's take a little moment then just as we begin to prepare for our service. Uh, it's nice to be able to be in the church and to be recording it here today. It just creates a little sense of familiarity. So let's pause and be still as we come to worship together. Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in any and every season. Father, we thank you for the good news that is ours in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for your love and for your mercies, which are new every morning. For Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And for your unfailing love, which goes from generation to generation. Father, thank you for all the loving kindness that we've known and experienced at your hand. And thank you, Lord, that you continue to show your mercies to us. So as we gather around your word in this little service today, may we know your presence with us wherever we are. And may we know, Lord, that you are the God who is everywhere at once and especially near to those who call upon your name and who listen for your voice. So open your word to us and us to your word, we pray. Lord, have mercy and look upon us with grace, we pray. Forgive us for our sins and for all, Lord, the things <clears throat> that we have either left undone or done through neglect or disobedience that have grieved you. Father, we are truly sorry. And thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ through which you show us your willingness, Lord, to remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. And so in that grace we come, in the name of Jesus we come and we thank you, Lord, for your love which summons us and invites us to listen anew to your word this day. And so as we pray, we add, Lord, the words that you've taught us to pray and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to carry on with our journey through Philippians. We're in chapter 4, nearly at the end. Uh, and we had a little break there, but we've been looking at chapter 4, where Paul, at the end of this lockdown epistle, where he, uh, writing to the church in Philippi from his um, 
sell it if you like. It's, it was a rented house, but he was, uh, had a, a, he was physically restrained, chained to a guard in this rented house, awaiting his trial before Caesar in Rome. And so he was uh, writing this epistle, as we've thought, all the way through from lockdown, his own version of lockdown, <clears throat> and urging and encouraging the Philippians. A church that was in a a strong Roman colony, a church that had strong Judaizing influences, a church that knew its own internal tensions to stay faithful to Jesus, to fix their eyes upon him and to rejoice. Uh, And the last time we looked at chapter four, we were thinking about Paul's entreaty to rejoice and to know the peace of God, that actually when you let go and focus on uh, on the grace and the goodness of God uh, and stop trying to control things that actually it can be his peace. It can be under those circumstances that his peace flows. So we're going to pick up, we're going to read chapter 4 verses 10 to 20, which is the next little part as Paul thanks the church in Philippi for supporting him in his ministry with the gift that was sent to him via Epaphroditus, one of the Philippians who had come to Rome bearing a gift and stayed to support Paul in his ministry, along with Paul's other protege, Timothy. Let's hear God's word. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength." Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Powerful words. And words which I'm sure uh, you've meditated on over the years, as we all have. I can, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Timely words in this coronavirus world, where from a world of plenty, at least for us, certainly in the West, uh, we understood what it was to live in plenty, perhaps without being fully aware of the plenty of our lives, where we were free to come and go, where all the things that we've been used to, gathering socially, gathering and going out uh, to shops or theatres or the cinema or restaurants or whatever, just the freedom to live what we used to call a normal life. And now, of course, we discover that that normal is no longer there. And we're living, at least for the time being, under strange restrictions, which seem to make life thin, threadbare in some respects, lacking in the fullness of life and relationship and freedom and experience and the riches that we have known and probably taken for granted. And so in this passage, we find Paul saying that I have learned the secret of being content. We'll get to that in just a little while. But the tone of this passage, of course, is a tone of gratitude. Gratitude alongside contentment. Paul is grateful to the Philippians for the concern which they have shown for him in his ministry, for the gifts which he sent with Epaphroditus as the only church that really took serious heed of the fact that Paul, as an itinerant missionary, an apostle, a traveling preacher, one who had a tent-making trade that he could from time to time operate, but it wasn't a mainstay. Uh, And so Paul depended on the support of the church. And so Paul is uh, taking this opportunity 
just to express gratitude and to have an attitude of thankfulness for the blessing that he's received. It's quite hard when our circumstances become lean or the world becomes thin uh, and it's not as rich or as full as it was to focus on the negative. It's understandable. Our human nature laments, regrets, mourns the loss of that which we've known and taken for granted in the past, perhaps, and suddenly we focus on what we don't have. The real challenge then is how we find gratitude in amongst all of the things that are missing. How we're able then to focus on what we do have. And that focus just may be as simple as recognizing that uh, in our society, even those people who've not been able to work have been furloughed and still have an income. Of course, there are many people who have or will have lost their jobs, and I'm not suggesting that this is not or is not <clears throat> excuse me, going to be a lean time for some. But where can we find thanksgiving and gratitude? For a roof over our heads, for the food that we have, for clean water in the taps, for access to health care. That we, uh, although we are taking sensible and wise precautions to avoid infection, have a health care system behind us that is there and is ready to cope with our need, should that, God forbid, arise. And so Paul was recognizing that there was much that he could be grateful for in amongst the situation he found himself in where his freedoms were limited, where he couldn't go and preach and support the churches he'd planted or plant other churches in the way that he'd wanted to do. He escaped from a, a, a planned attack in Jerusalem by appealing to Caesar and came into the custody of Roman soldiers, and that's how he made his escape. But nonetheless, his freedoms were curtailed and now awaiting trial, and he could see no end in sight at the time that he was writing this, Paul was looking to find gratitude and thankfulness and blessing. And so Paul recognizes at the same time that it's not an automatic given. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned. And so if you're struggling and you're not in that place of gratitude or if you're finding things difficult or challenging and you're not feeling particularly thankful, well, just remember that Paul, like you, had to learn. He had to go on that journey from his freedom to his restrictions, that journey from being able to do and move according to the impulse of the Spirit to recognizing that for a season he was in this lockdown situation. And actually the blessing that he could receive were the gifts that were provided from the Philippians, the support of Timothy and Epaphroditus, the people round about him his memory of the churches that he'd planted. And of course, the gift to all of us was that in that lockdown season in Rome, Paul wrote epistles to the Philippians, Ephesians, the Colossians, uh, which have become amongst the richest parts of the New Testament, some of the deepest theology and thinking and understanding about God and who he is. Those might never have come into being had Paul not learned to make the best of his circumstances. I have learned what it is. I've learned the secret. Uh, I've learned to be content and I've learned the secret of being content. And so Paul says twice, I have learned. Uh, and earlier on, he, he talks about not that I've received all this, but I press on. So Paul wasn't somebody who presented himself as the finished article. He knew that he was constantly on a journey, pressing on. He knew that he was constantly uh, learning about whatever it took in, in order to be uh, faithful to God in the circumstances that he faced. And we need to do that as well. Paul had plenty experience of going hungry. Paul had plenty experience of weathering literal storms and metaphorical storms, the storms of opposition and persecution, but also the storms we read of at the end of Acts and so on. Paul knew suffering and Paul learned to submit and surrender himself. So how can we learn, as Paul did, to be content in any and every circumstance? Well, I've said it already, but let me say it again. Look around you at what you have and be thankful. And that's sometimes not easy uh, if you're bored or frustrated, if the months just seem to drag on, if, if life is returning, but not with the fullness or the richness or the quality uh, that you knew before, and it seems thin by comparison. 
Measure what you want against what you actually need because Paul recognized that God would meet his needs, though not necessarily all of his wants. And in that, for Paul and for us, there was a humility. There was a humility in recognizing that my needs or my wants are not the most important thing, but that God in his gracious mercy will meet us where we are and will meet the needs that he knows that we have. What does it mean to learn the secret? It means to learn gratitude, as I've been saying, at what you've got rather than what you haven't got. And it's a journey of learning to trust that the Father will keep his promise. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, said Jesus, and all these other things will be added to you. When he was telling people uh, about uh, not worrying about what you will eat or what you will wear, because God feeds the birds and he clothes the grass of the field, he'll look after you, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, said Jesus, and all these things will be given. Your Father knows what you need, he says. And sometimes it's about that, famous cliche that you've heard over the years, letting go and letting God. Cliches become cliches for a reason, because they contain truths so valuable they're worth repeating. And sometimes it's in the letting go and just accepting what we can't have or do, the freedoms that we knew uh, have at least for the time being gone. And so Paul learned in his circumstances to trust, to do so with humility and gratitude and to recognize that by abandoning himself and his circumstances to God, and to trust in a good, loving Father who knew and understood Paul's needs, that all would be well. And so that was the secret that Paul learned and wanted to encourage the Philippians to learn as well. And his reason for saying all of that was just to recognize and to express his gratitude to the Philippians for their giving. Uh, because he, he wanted to say to them, thank you for what you've given and what you're giving. Um, but at the same time, I want you to know that I, I'm trusting God. And that's a great place to be in, to be caught between that place of gratitude to people and to God and to have learned to trust. And so he focuses in this next part on the generosity of the Philippians, who had demonstrated a thoughtful awareness of Paul's needs and a practical response to them. You know, sometimes we can be so wrapped up and caught up in our own selves, in our own needs or world, in our own challenges or difficulties or, or, or concerns, that actually we lose sight of the other. We lose sight of the needs of the other people. And the Philippian church, as we've seen going through, were certainly under pressures, pressures from Rome, pressures from the Jewish community, internal pressures. There was a little fight going on, apparently, between two women that threatened to uh, cause uh, uh, fractures within the church. And yet, nonetheless, this church had recognized, they had been able to see beyond themselves and beyond their own needs to recognize that Paul had needs too. And there's a challenge for us too sometimes. We can become focused. We're sinful, fallen human beings. We're fundamentally selfish. Uh, we, we, we want what we need. And we can fail to see what the other person needs. The Philippians were the only ones out of all the churches Paul planted that kept a thought for what Paul might need, how Paul might be uh, experiencing life. And, and they took responsibility for gathering a collection, a gift, which they sent Epaphroditus to deliver to Paul in Rome. That was a huge commitment, a generous sacrificial commitment on the part of the Philippians, but to send an envoy in Epaphroditus who would go all the way to Rome to bring that gift to him. And so Paul was so grateful to them for recognizing his need and eager to see that they would be blessed for their faithfulness. He's grateful for the gifts that they sent, but he's even more excited to see how their generosity and obedience to the Lord would be blessed to them in return. And of course, it is a source of blessing when we bless others. I know it's not been easy or possible for you perhaps to, uh, to give or support others in the way that you might have done if we weren't under lockdown. But bear in mind that the needs of others are still there. 
And please do bear in mind uh, that the needs of the church are still there as well. Uh, because obviously people aren't in a position to give. It's not so easy at the moment. There is a, a means. You can go to the Church of Scotland home, uh, home uh, website and the homepage and there's a, a link in the bottom of the page that you can give to your local congregation and that money is then passed on to that congregation. So bear in mind that the church in Philippi was keen to support the ministry of the gospel was keen not just to support Paul personally as their father figure in the Lord and the founder of the church, but they were keen to support the ministry of the gospel through Paul, hence their giving. And, and so we ask you to give for a number of reasons. It's your discipleship. It's what you're called to do, to be involved in supporting the ministry and the mission of the church as best you can. And sometimes that's through practical service, but that sometimes is just through giving to finance and support the work of the church. But Paul recognizes that for the Philippians, it meant that it opened the door for God to bless them. If you bless others, if you bless the Lord, then you open the door for the Lord to bless you. You're expressing your trust in a God who is able to meet all of your needs. And therefore, you take the risk of giving away that which you might otherwise keep or hoard for yourself uh, and doing so because it's an act of faith. It's an act of faith and generosity to give to the Lord that which uh, might further the kingdom and see its advance. And so Paul recognizes that these gifts are gifts given not just to him, but given to the Lord. And you know, it's always a challenge when we give gifts. Sometimes when we give either to, to the Lord, to the church, or to some Christian ministry or something that we support, or we give to people, we, we might have a concern about how is it, how is it being used? Uh, I've given money in the past, sometimes given money to people and, and thought it would be used well, only to discover that I was feeding someone's addiction or, or that they were not responsible in the way that they took that money and used it. And, and I've been tempted in the past to think, to feel aggrieved uh, or to feel that I was ripped off or suckered in some way. But you know, anything that we give, anything that we give to the Lord with a clear conscience and with goodwill, out of compassion or concern for the other, even if the other doesn't use it well or wisely, it doesn't matter. You've given that gift first and foremost to the Lord and then given it to the person. There's a story at the beginning of, of 1 Samuel uh, of Eli's sons. Now, Eli was, was the priest in charge at Shiloh, which at that time was the, was the house of God. And Eli's sons were told were wicked. And one of the ways in which their wickedness is described is that people used to bring offerings, burnt offerings, lambs, and so on, uh, to offer to the Lord. And, and the custom was that the, the, the fat on the meat would be burnt off and that smoking fat would be the, the smoke, the fragrant offering to the Lord. And then after the fat had been burnt off, the meat would be boiled and then the priest could eat from uh, that uh, offering, but only after it had been ritually presented through the burning of fat and through the boiling. But Eli's sons, they didn't particularly care for boiled meat. They preferred a roast. And so what they would do was that they would take the offerings, try to get people to hand over their offerings of meat before that was done. And then they would take the meat and then they would just roast it and, and eat it for themselves. They wouldn't bother burning the fat for the Lord. They wouldn't bother boiling it in the way that their law prescribed. They'd just take it for themselves. Now, Eli's sons were, were judged uh, quite dramatically in quite, in quite a, a fearsome kind of way. Uh, they both died. Um, but the gifts that those worshippers brought were no less seen by God as an offering to him because Eli's sons abused and misused them. There's a difference between when we give and what people do with what we give. Now, as a church, we have to be accountable and responsible for how we use and use well the money that is given. Uh, but at the same time, your calling in mine is to be involved in supporting the work of the Lord, either through giving to the church or some other Christian ministry, or just by recognizing the needs that others have and supporting them uh, quietly, not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing, but just doing in that uh, godly, humble way what it takes to support other people. And so Paul wants the church in Philippi to be blessed. He wants the church in Philippi to know the fullness of God's blessing upon them. And so he's keen. He's keen that they should know that he is grateful. He's keen that they should know that 
uh, God is providing for his needs and that he's learned to be, uh, he's learned to depend on God and to trust God both in seasons of plenty and in seasons of want, whatever is outward circumstances. And we need to learn that too, especially in this season of want, maybe not in terms of food, but uh, in other ways, in this thin season. What does it mean for us to trust in God in a season of want as well as uh, plenty? What does it mean for us to learn the secret of being content uh, in that sign? And he thanks the Philippian church for their gifts, and then he adds with that, uh, he ends with that beautiful uh, phrase, and my God will meet all your needs according to his, the glory, uh, to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. My God will meet all your needs. That's the promise. Going back to the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus made. He uh, feeds the birds and clothes the grass. Uh, he knows what you need. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And so perhaps we just need to take a moment to look around and to think, well, how has he met? How is he meeting my needs? How much worse might it have been if? And so on. To be thankful for the things that, that have happened, the support or sustenance that you have, the roof over your head, the food in the cupboard and so on, the provision that God has made for you one way or another. We can't see what way things are going to go. The future looks strange and uncertain at the moment. We're just living from day to day, week to week, month to month. But nonetheless, my God will meet all of your needs. We'll eat all of our needs as we fix our eyes upon him. So let's pray together. Loving Father, thank you for the grace which meets us. Thank you, Lord, for the power of these promises, that there is a contentment to be found, whether in plenty or in want, as we hide ourselves in you, abandon ourselves to you, and learn anew to trust you, even in unwelcome or difficult seasons in our lives. Father, we want to say thank you, to say thank you for the things that we so easily take for granted that many other people in this world are denied or deprived of. We want to say thank you, Lord, for the, the food that we have, for the roof over our heads. We want to thank you, Lord, for the provision for our needs. And we want to thank you for the measure of health we have. And, and if we've not experienced coronavirus or had to contend with that personally, well, we thank you for that because many people have either personally in their own health or in terms of the health or even the death of a loved one. So, Father, we thank you. Uh, and we ask, Lord, that you help us to keep on learning these secrets, to keep on learning what it is to trust you in an unknown and uncertain world. And we pray that you'll help us uh, to have that uh, perspective that the church in Philippi did, to be concerned not just about how it is with us, but to be outward looking, concerned for the needs of others, generous towards the mission and the ministry of your church, towards the needs of other people and responsible, knowing that whatever we give to you is not lost or wasted, but is an investment in a kingdom which will never fail or fall because King Jesus is its head. So we thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your generosity. We thank you for these promises to meet our needs and provide for us, your people. And all these things we pray, seeking blessing on one another. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Thank you for joining us again today at this Wednesday midweek service. It's good to be back with you, even though I can't see you. But I look forward to the time when we will be able to see one another at a distance, but in person. Uh, and until then, if there's any way in which we can support or help you, please do get in touch. Minister at sgt.church is my email address. Uh, I'll put a message on our Facebook page. But otherwise, uh, I hope all is well with you. God bless you. Bye-bye.